Welcome to the Landscaping Podcast. My name is Joel Barnett and I'm your host. And in today's episode, I'm talking with Adam Beswick from Avada Gardens. Adam runs a design and construction company with his wife in Tasmania and they've been doing that for about 11 years. And he had a good start to his uh, career in the horticulture industry, starting work at a nursery uh, in his first couple of jobs. And then that's also where he met his wife and then they went on to start their own business. So he's got a good uh, horticultural knowledge. And then his uh, story about how he actually got from nursery into landscaping is a, a pretty interesting story and um, what unique as well. And there's a couple of good tips to take away from this chat with Adam where um, he talks about the how physically hard landscaping can be, but then he also mentions a, a recent purchase that he has made to make that easier going up and down the hills of Tasmania. And he also touches on how mentally hard it can be as well, uh, landscaping, especially when you're running your own business. So uh, it was a good, good chat with Adam. Good story how he's moved, he's worked originally in Western Australia and now in Tasmania, so a couple of different extremes. Um, but yeah, hopefully, there's something you take out of this chat and enjoy this chat with Adam Beswick. Adam, thank you very much for joining us on the Landscape Podcast. My first question for you is How did you start in the industry? How did I start? Well, it's a good one. It started, would you believe, 20 years ago to the year, so. It was 2003, and I was fresh out of high school. So I grew up in Perth in Western Australia, so the school system's a bit different over there. So I was 17, and I'd done all my exams, and we just more or less finished high school. We graduated, and I reckon it was about three or four days that had elapsed, and my mother said, oh, what are you doing with yourself? And I said, oh, well, I've got to wait to see what courses I get into next year. And, you know, and she said, oh, what are you doing about work? And I said, well, I don't know yet. I want to just wing it, you know, and this was, you know, late November, December or something. So I had no intention of getting stuck into doing some hardcore work. But um, my mother used to work at this little electrical place directly across the road from a very large wholesale plant nursery. And one day she said as a joke, oh, I should drop you a resume in there. And I said, yeah, you should do that. And uh, lo and behold, the next day she said, oh, they, re- they want to see you. They want to see you. They dropped it in. And I dropped it in for you. And they uh, they said they want you to come in. So I did. And, uh, of course, on my resume, he said stupid things like, you know, your interests were keeping fit and being outdoors. So that was like the first thing that uh, ticked the boxes. So they straight away, they said, yeah, you can uh, come and work for us now. So I started as a nursery hand on the very bottom of the bottom rung. And um, yeah, I was working for like $7 an hour or something stupid as a nursery tradesman or whatever the award was. And uh, so I was working there one day a week um, when I started getting into my course for the next year, which was environmental science is what I got into. Originally, I wanted to be an architect, but I didn't get into my uni course because my marks just weren't good enough. Mm-hmm. So so environmental science was my one of my backups. Um, my other one was graphic design, but... Before school had finished, someone had nicked my folio. So I uh, I didn't have any work to show, so I couldn't really get into that either. So sort of like a, I fell into the job and just sort of kept working while I was studying. So that was really only part-time, one day a week. It, could, it should have been casual, really, but they were paying me part-time rates, so it was much less pay. Yeah. So, yeah, worked for a really big... Uh, ch- wasn't a chain. We s- used to supply a really big chain nursery in Perth called Waldex. So we used to do a lot of potted colour, you know, like petunias and celosias and portulaca and just by the thousands. Like we had a huge, like half the nursery was roses, like bare root rose stock. And yeah, we just basically went hard at it. And, you know, I was one of the younger guys. So I used to get work pretty hard you know i'd be on the quad bike and going out into the 
into the nursery and setting out thousands and thousands of plants, you know, in the in the heat or in the rain or whatever it happened to be. So that was my start in the industry. But from there, it sort of went through a natural progression. When I was studying at TAFE, I met a guy who ended up being, and he's still a really close friend, and we got talking. I said, oh, what do you do for work? And he said, oh, I work at a plant nursery as well. And I said, oh, so that's interesting. I said, so do I. I said, well, you know, where do you work? And he said, oh, I work at this plant nursery that basically specializes in Australian native stock. And I said, oh, you know, it sounds interesting. And one thing led to another. And I said the question, I said, oh, how much do you get paid? And he said, oh, I'll get about $16 an hour. So I thought, can you put a word in and I'll go and I'll go and see if I can work with you? Because I was, I was pretty sick of working for such low pay for a start. And just the conditions were not the best. Um, I, I even asked my big boss at the nursery for a reference. And his words were, get, get one of the supervisors to do it because I only give references to people who are going places. And um, I thought that was the biggest kick in the guts. So I thought, yeah, this is the this is the right time for me to to leave this nursery and, uh, and move on. So I started working and studying at the same time and um, just basically working with my best mate and his, his mum used to work there as well. So it was sort of a, a pretty good environment. It was really cruisy compared to the other place I worked. You know, the boss was hardly ever there and, you know, it was just uh, sort of being outdoors and being on tractors and sort of bagging up big trees and just doing, you know, a full gum up run, the run of the nursery, you know, we used to do. So worked there for a while, finished up my studies and decided that, I probably didn't really have the passion for environmental work because back then it was sort of either, well, you either work for the government or you work for like mining companies. And that wasn't, wasn't really for me. So I just decided to keep working and started working full time, did that for a few years. Um, from there, one of the head horticulturalists at the nursery decided he was going to leave and start his own nursery. Um, so we had a bit of a vacuum of, we had no one to fill the position. So my mate and I got tapped on the shoulder and said, look, can you start running the nursery basically and doing all the production and dispatch work? So we were on potting machines, we were bagging up trees, we were picking orders and sending them off to landscapers for delivery, all sorts of different things, fixing, you know, irrigation systems and creating new areas for planting in the nursery. So we did a huge variety of different tasks. We didn't have a job description as such. We just did did whatever we had to do at the time. So from there, it was, it was a pretty cushy little job. I really enjoyed working there. And being a wholesale nursery, we used to get all sorts of people come through the <laughs> come through the gate. You know, we'd get people like backpackers, we get people who were fresh out of prison who needed work. Like we, you know, the the sort of environment's a bit different to retail nurseries because you're not on display. You know, there's not people asking you questions. It's just you're just in a big, it's just a big farm type environment. And yeah. now and again, you get landscapers turning up and and wanting stock. So we would get blow-ins and people come and go all the time, and some people. We were a bit unsavoury, to say the least, but they'd never last very long. So long story short, one day this uh, this young woman came to the nursery and she uh, just kept to herself mostly. And one day I, I went and said hello and she didn't reply. And I thought, how rude. And she had a pair of headphones in. I didn't notice. So it ended up she was working in the propagation shed with all the other ladies because that's just how it used to work in the nursery. The boss used to keep the, the men and women segregated for some reason. So the boys were out in the yard in the heat 
and in the rain doing all the the hard work and the, the ladies were usually in the prop shed you know propagating and sowing seeds and you know doing cuttings and stuff like that but one day yeah she this uh this lady was like oh i don't want to work in the prop shed i want to work out in the yard with with the guys and um, the boss was a bit reluctant and said off oh, i don't know if you really want to work with those guys and try to put her off but she was adamant she said no i want to work out in the yard and and work with the guys and so she did we, we just worked together and that woman ended up being my wife in the end so it didn't didn't start off as a, a very romantic place to meet you know we weren't in our best attire and uh, it wasn't the uh, wasn't the most glamorous work on the planet but it was uh, obviously conducive to romance in some way so that's where I first met my wife and she's obviously my business partner and um, yep. partner in crime now. So from that, I sort of got to a stage where I don't know, I was sick of the sick of the nursery industry and I wanted to go my own way. And um, at the time I was studying, uh, doing Japanese martial arts and I'd been doing it since I was 15. So I spoke to my instructor and i said oh do you know anybody that does japanese sword work and he said oh not offhand but i do know of this this one guy this japanese guy who was a friend of my teacher so he, he's got a landscaping business so maybe you should seek him out and send him an email or something so i did i looked him up online and he was a bonsai master Japanese landscaping expert who'd won quite a few awards and I sent him an email and I said basically do you do do you still uh, teach uh, Kenjutsu or sword work because I'd like to learn and as a, a very small sideline at the bottom of the email I wrote by, ch by any chance if you're you know you need a labor or something like I'm in the industry so like give me a call basically and a couple of days elapsed and I thought nothing of it I got an email back saying that he didn't teach sword work anymore because he, he was too old basically he was in his late 50s 60s and he said that you know he, he, he didn't teach anymore but it was interesting that I needed some help so can you come down and meet me on site so I jumped at the chance and I went down to the University of WA where they were doing a big, big Japanese garden down there. So I went down there and I saw him and uh, he asked me a few questions and basically said, when can you start? So I said, well, I need to give my employer some notice. So I think I gave him the, the minimum notice I needed to and, uh, and, and jumped straight into to, to being a landscaper, basically, or being a labourer for a, a very well-known and um, respected landscaper. So that was my first foray into landscaping. And I jumped in at a very, very pressure cooker style environment for my boss at the time because it was the King's Park wildflower festival um they were they built an entire japanese garden in king's park that was based on a design from a very very famous well-known japanese designer in japan and he was in charge of basically bringing it to life and he built most of it and i came in at the very end so you know what it's like probably at the end of the the flower and garden show where it's probably all very hectic and you're trying to get everything finished. That was exactly the environment I came into. So I had to sink or swim basically. And the boss was, was not, not a very nice person. <laughs> it was very stern and very harsh. And um, if you didn't do the right thing, he, he, he told you pretty clearly. And um, if you didn't do what he wanted you to do, then you're out the door basically. So it was one of those 
learn via osmosis moments or, or or get out. So we ended up doing a really good job there. And I think there's not a great deal of photos online to show that garden and its scale, but it was a big traditional Japanese garden, but it was, it utilized only WA endemic species. So that was pretty different. I think I've, I've looked myself because this was back in the day before everybody had camera phones and, you know, it was like one megapixel or something on your flip phone. And, you know, nobody was taking photos of, of stuff back then. So I think I've only found one bit of evidence of, of the garden and what it looks like. And I've got it saved on, on the computer. So it's pretty interesting. Yeah, it sounds like a fascinating garden if it's a Japanese garden, but using WA endemic plants. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it was different. But I mean, this is the thing like you can you, you can swap out a lot of natives for for exotics, you know, especially when it comes to hedging and topiary, you know, you've got wistringes and dodonias and things like that that just clip up beautifully and they're a lot hardier as well. So I think that was yeah, probably two thousand and oh, 2008, sort of 2009. Um, from there, yeah, it was, it was basically my dream job. Absolutely loved it. The only problem was is that we only did Japanese gardens. So, I mean, Japanese gardens is a bit of a niche, especially when you're a supposed expert. And sometimes you'd have big gaps. So we'd come to the end of a big project and then there'd be nothing to do. And the boss would be like, well, I've got no work, so you have to go and find some more work somewhere. But all I wanted to do was was work for him <laughs> and do and do that sort of work all the time. But, you know, there wasn't a great deal of call out there. I mean, he kept us busy for a fair while, but there was always times when there was big gaps and it was difficult to try and balance. Well, I still want to work for this person and do these awesome jobs, but at the same time, I can't go a month or two months without work. And if I go and start with somebody else, they're not going to appreciate me disappearing to do your job. So it was just one of those difficult sort of scenarios to be in. But we we did some great jobs together. And eventually, because I was a laborer at the time, like I said, I started off at the bottom just doing, you know, grunt work and didn't really do anything uh, overly difficult but then our, our basically our leading hand got fired and um same sort of thing i i got pushed up into a, another echelon of of uh, responsibility so i ended up being the leading hand and uh, subsequently um preferred subcontractor for doing most of the work at that time so yeah we we did all sorts of jobs we we did a huge a meditation center out in Serpentine in Perth in WA, which was just a massive, massive Buddhist uh, monastery, basically. And the entire place was surrounded by like native Australian native gardens. So we, that, that was an enormous job. Um, but the what, one of the main highlights was was winning the LIA WA 2010 Award for Excellence. And that was obviously our, our company, Japanese Landscaping, won that. Not me personally, but I was involved with the, the winning garden as a leading hand. And uh, that was another Japanese garden that mainly used WA natives. Um, so we sort of, I'm not sure if we started a trend. I'm not, I'm not sure if, uh, if it is a trend, but we were definitely exploring those avenues because you know WA is a very dry place and uh, you know we had water restrictions like a lot of other states I'm sure have now um, so it made sense to go down that road of, of using Australian native species and we sort of did the same thing but we, we try to keep it with what we knew what to do best so that was that after that decided to go go off on my own because like I said before it was difficult when we had these big breaks in the work mm. so I decided that I needed to sort of venture off and, and try and do my own thing 
and um, I sort of had had the best intentions early on, wanting to do my own thing, but I realised very quickly that probably wasn't quite ready to go off on my own. I was only pretty young and decided to to get a job uh, working for another landscaping firm that was around that was doing a lot of work, and we had it was a totally different work environment went from going from a team of two, three, to like a team of 10, uh, which was really difficult transition. The thing I realized real quick was that although we were really good at building Japanese gardens, we sort of didn't have the skill set of like just doing normal landscaping. Um, so that was a pretty, a pretty harsh learning curve I mean, you know, we were pretty good with our horticultural stuff and, you know, we could place rocks and, you know, we had good eye for detail and things. But when it came to just doing hardcore, you know, paving or hardcore walls or construction, we sort of didn't have that that experience. So I started with this company that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> like a lot of them don't exist anymore. Um, worked for them for 18 months and hated it, totally hated it. Because the the bosses were complete bullies, financial mis mismanaged the business big time. Uh, our firm ended up getting liquidated on the last minute, and uh, we we had no idea. All the workers were sort of invited to the yard one day, and they said, "Oh, fellas, uh, we're going into liquidation," and that was it. Sort of got got. Uh, the writing on the wall and they actually wanted me to stay on to complete a few projects but I thought the, the thing was is they they couldn't pay a lot of their bills that they couldn't pay Bunnings they couldn't pay Mida 10 all of these big firms they owed a lot of money to a lot of people and I thought I'm just a lowly worker mm. I don't know how I'm going to get paid if these these other businesses and subbies aren't getting paid so I decided to uh, to leave and just from there, it was just a uphill slog. So we're talking like 2008, 2009. And that's when the GFC was really crunching everybody. And if you were around then, and you know anyone else listening was around then, it's pretty difficult. I mean, COVID was difficult, but the GFC was pretty hard. Like it hit a lot of businesses quite a lot. There was a lot of businesses hiring guys and then just, keeping them on probation and flicking them as soon as they got a big job finished. So, yeah, I basically went, I bounced around a few different landscapers and learned a few different things. But eventually, I got let go from a couple of places and I started going down a bit of a bit of a negative mindset and wasn't sure if I wanted to, to do this sort of stuff anymore. And was feeling a bit dejected and over it. And... Um, my father-in-law said, "Oh, why don't you, why don't you do some lawns and gardens sort of stuff?" And me, being a young young fellow who, who'd done a lot of you know high end or what I consider high end work, sort of thought, "Oh, well, I'm better than that." You know, like why should I do that for? But after a while, I thought about it and thought that's probably a pretty good idea. You know, to to segueing into having my own business because I know now that. Doing full-on construction work, you know, is stressful and you need to be completely committed and on the ball. And at the time, I was just I was just too young and inexperienced to really take that on. So from there, funnily enough, um, my wife and I pooled our resources and we actually bought a lawns and gardens franchise business. Uh, I'm not going to say which one, but I'll say it wasn't Jim's. So we'll go there. And uh, basically, yeah, I bought a, a board of lords and gardens round, including a trailer and a load of gear. Basically, I had two um, two twenty eight inch Dwyer and Felton cylinder mowers, you know, brush cutters, stuff like that. And I had really very limited maintenance experience or knowledge. And um, I decided to give it a whirl. And the training wasn't too bad, to be quite honest. We did about four weeks training with another franchisee and it was actually really invaluable i got some good some good uh, tips off the other guys 
So I started basically with a, I bought a round, which was, you know, all the equipment plus, uh, I think it was about 80 or 90 regular clients. That the, the previous owner of the round had built up. I reckon about 20 or 30 of those were fake. So I got duped. <laughs> so by the time I uh, I started working, I think the, the first day of the round when I had to pick up from the other guy, I was um, I was really quite nervous because I'd never really driven around with a big heavy trailer before. And if anyone knows, like big cylinder mowers, they weigh a fair bit and um, they're, they're pretty cumbersome things. So I was driving around with these in the back of the trailer and um so but it, it was a good experience because it, it started me off like dealing with clients and, and maintaining people's gardens and and knowing you know how to cut a lawn properly and you know with cylinder miles we were putting big stripes in them and you know making them look all fancy and uh, at the time like lawns like people's lawns in perth were just going off like everybody wanted the greenest flattest lawn i think that's the same just about everywhere but um yeah, so we started off doing small gardening jobs, regular maintenance, hedge trimming, lawn mowing, that sort of thing. Built up to about 100 regular clients. So I'd do monthly cuts or every two weeks in summer or sometimes every week. So I, I watched one of the episodes recently. I think it's um, Darren from, from Mint Design, and he, he said that he did a bit of maintenance for a while and he felt as though maintenance guys were looked down upon and as soon as i saw that i thought yeah he's nailed it like that's exactly how i felt at the time because i had a background in in sort of landscaping and landscape construction work and here i was mowing people's lawns and i would get overlooked for jobs all the time even though i'd send out letters and i'd send out emails to to my new clients and basically told them what we could do I remember rocking up to a client's, like I used to do a monthly cut and I'd rock up to a client's house and half the lawn was paved. And I said, what's going on here? And he said, oh, yeah, we got X, Y, Z to come and pave it. And I said, oh, you know, I could have done that. And I said, oh, I didn't realize he did that. And I said, well, I'm sending out <laughs> sending out letters to, to tell you what I do and what I can do. And so it happened a lot and I'd get overlooked for just basic landscaping work all the time because they just thought I was a lawny yeah. or that I was reading. So 100% think that that's right. A lot of maintenance people do get looked down upon from just people in general as well as, well, I can't speak for any, everybody, but that's the way it felt to me anyway at the time. So I had that business for three years and can't say I really loved what I did, but it taught me how to run a business. It taught me how to deal with customers. It taught me how to do, you know, how to do a great job and how to leave a customer happy at the end of the day. Just all that sort of stuff, stuff like soft networking and things like that. So although it wasn't the most glamorous sort of career, it was a really good training platform for for learning how to have a business and how to how to run a business so we got to a stage where perth was just getting way too expensive to live this is sort of like 2012 2013 so we decided to buy a property over the internet in tasmania <laughs> and the and we hadn't even seen the property. We, we, we totally bought it blind, but we had people come and check it out to make sure, you know, there wasn't borers in the timber and the place was going to fall down. So we ended up moving. So at the time, I had a five-year-old and we we moved down here with the intention of doing the same thing. So doing just garden maintenance work. Um, so I got down here and um, basically landed a bit of work with the local council. So I did 
a lot of their <laughs> it's a funny story actually one day we had we, we just moved down here like we, we drove across the Nullarbor and, and came down here in a trailer and a couple of utes and we, we'd only been in the house a couple of couple of days and some guy pulls up on the driveway and he says oh he goes oh someone's living here he said oh, I didn't realize and I said yeah, no, we just moved in. And he said, oh, I've got a 20-ton excavator at the bottom of your property because we had five acres. He said, I've got a 20-ton digger down there doing some work. He said, I should probably stop him. <laughs> I said, what's going on? He goes, oh, you had a fire abatement notice on your property and the um, previous owner skipped out on it. So we were sort of left with this, this, this basically this environmental weed called gorse. It's all over our property. And... Um, he, we just got talking. I said to him, "Look, you know, I've just moved down here, and this is what I do. And you know, if you have any work, it'd be really handy if you could point me in the right direction." And he said, oh, "I'll put you in contact with parks and reserves at the local council." So, long story short, I started doing contracting work for them, which is basically brush cutting work. You know, with a big steel brush cutter blasting through. You know, stormwater drains and you know, just the really unglamorous sort of stuff. Sometimes I was up to my waist in a stormwater drain and with a pair of steel cap wellies on, and you just know that <laughs> there's something in there, there's, there's some reptile or something around your feet. So just started off doing any anything I could get my hands on. So started doing that. And basically from there decided that. I wanted, I wanted to get back into landscaping again, so I started basically building up and doing more and more of smaller gardens and, and then taking on smaller construction jobs and, and going from there. And 10 years later, we're still going. So that's basically the story. It's a bit long, but there you go. Now, where, where did you get the name from? Um, it's Funnily enough, it's a, um, it's a species of eucalypt that we have on our block called eucalyptus ovata so it's the it's called a black gun and um, at the time we didn't know but <laughs> the the property's got a, a very large biodiversity protection act on the property because the black gum species are actually a food source of the swift parrot which is a endangered migratory parrot that flies from Southern Taz to Victoria every year. Yeah, we have them at the front of my place, those parrots. Yeah, yeah. So we've got five acres of primarily uh, black gums, so eucalyptus ovata. So we were coming up with a name, and the wife's like, oh, what's the name of those gums that we've got? And I said, oh, it's ovata, eucalyptus ovata. She goes, yeah, that sounds pretty good. So we decided to to keep it at that. And it's got a bit of a bit of a meaning for us personally so nice. we can, yeah we we're we're a bit stuck with council like they they won't let us clear it not as though we want to but what we want to do with the block is is basically clear all of the noxious weed species and because we inherited a block that hadn't really been looked after we have a hard time trying to get contractors to come in and basically get rid of the weed species for us so yeah it's just a, a it's a bit of a difficult thing but I'm, I'm glad we've got them and it's a a great habitat like we we don't do anything to the bush we try and leave it as much as possible um so we we the first time we had the swift parrots that we actually saw them was last year so we had an absolute bucket load probably like 50 of them in our in our bush sort of nesting and feeding on the flowers so yeah it's pretty cool mm. yeah they're a stunning looking bird like i don't know whether it's the male or the female but one of them is is a lot duller than the rest i'm but, not um, sure about that yeah, yeah. We, we've we've got them i mean the thing with those migratory parrots is you're never too sure if they're going to come back because they don't sort of claim one place as their yeah. own so they might have them in in abundance one year, and the next year they they might go somewhere else. Mm. So we were just lucky to have them when we did, and um, you know we'd like to do more to to protect the bush and to sort of keep them coming back if we can. 
And what's the technique you, that you use to get rid of the weed? Well, I mean, really, the, the problem is so bad that it really requires heavy machinery. Um, you know, we've had diggers come in before and, and take care of it, and we've basically got to put it in a pile and burn it. But because of the bushfire risk, there's only certain times a year that we can really do that successfully. Um, but the council get a bit uh, freezy because they say that, you know, if a digger comes on and disturbs the understory, then, you know, it could have a have some, have some sort of impact. And I know from from studying environmental science that, you know, it can be replaced, you know, like lamandras and things like that can be replaced. And there's nothing really thriving underneath them because it's full of gorse. And the, the, the thing is, like across the road from where I live, there's just acres and acres of it. And it's one of the worst environmental weeds you can get. It just takes over. And the seed stays viable in the soil for like 40 years or something like that. So, yeah, it's just horrible stuff. And I wouldn't I wouldn't wish it on anybody's property. It's horrible. Doesn't, doesn't look good at all? Uh, no, not really. It's just, uh, it's, it's got a yellow flower. And I reckon I've seen Bear Grylls eat one of them. Yeah. But they're super spiky. And they're just... I mean, you know, we've got blackberries as well, which is uh, yeah. not the nicest, but at least you can eat the fruit. Um, so, yeah, that's where the name came from. That's, that's the answer to that one. So the uh, the tree species that we have. Yeah. So uh, what sort of work did you did you start doing in the early days? With uh, with age, uh, well, look, we used to just do a lot of like, the, the early days of, of working in, in Tassie, you mean? Yeah, yeah. I uh, just... Just real basic stuff like doing, you know, just small paving jobs or, you know, doing a, a, a couple of low retaining walls here and there. And, you know, now and again, we'd take on like a really big, like big clean up or something and completely blitz someone's garden and, you know, try and make it as uh, as nice as possible. But, you know, back then, you know, I was totally unknown. Like I had no family or friends in Tassie, so it was sort of, it's really difficult mm. to get a name going, and um, it's just it's just, it's been a pretty hard slog, to be honest, but worth it, definitely. And have you uh, had any employees on? Um, no, only because I just haven't found the right person, to be honest. I've tried hiring a couple of guys over the years, and they've just been super unreliable. And I suppose you'd know. You know, if you've got a big project on and that you're, you're planning on doing and, you know, someone turns up for a, a week and then buggers off, it's um, it's a big letdown. So, no, I mean, I've got a, a list of subcontractors and people that we use for earthworks and things like that. But mainly my wife and I do do everything ourselves and we don't really get much out, outside help. I mean, we'd really probably like to get a labourer or so, or two, to perhaps uh, help us with some of the really difficult jobs that we, we end up getting. You know, like I, I had a guy, for, for instance, I think it was like last year, he sent me an email and he said, oh, I've looked at all your work and I really, really want to come and work for you. And I said, yeah, no worries, mate. I said, um, you know, I gave him, I had an interview at a local cafe and he seemed like a really nice bloke, you know, he was Fit and you know, I'm not sure if he was fit, but it was big. And I thought, yeah, we can uh, do something with that. He said he was semi experienced, said, yeah, no props. Um, and then I said, look, because we've got five acres, I said, I've got loads of firewood I need moved around. You know, I've got some some wood I need split, and I've got a bucket load of brush cutting to do. I said, come around once a week and do, do some work for me, and I'll pay you, and we'll see how you go. And if I'm impressed with your work ethic, then I'll I'll put you on, you know, without a doubt. And it just just a big letdown, really, to be quite honest. He he wasn't as experienced as he said he was, and he definitely wasn't as fit and conditioned as he said he was. And um, we we were doing some work in the yard and we're moving some bush rock because our property is on a major slope and there's there's bush rock everywhere and it's all dolerite, so it's super heavy, super hard stuff. All we were doing was moving some, you know football sized pieces of bush rock in a barrow like to different places and um 
my wife was working with him at the time to check him out and see how he was going. And he he ended up, uh, he lost his lunch. <laughs> he worked so hard. <laughs> and I think the shame of that, he uh, he never came back, actually. So, you know, that's not the sort of thing I want. I don't want people to to say that they're experienced and, and try and blag and to get a job because, as you know, it's not glamorous, it's not easy. And there's a lot of hard, selfless work that goes into projects. And, you know, I don't need somebody who's going to, to disappear and be unreliable. Hmm. And yeah, whenever I do a job ad, I'll put in that, that it's extremely physical work and lab, very labour intensive. But it doesn't matter how what sort of word you put in a job ad, people will say, oh, gee, this, this is actually hard work. But yeah, yeah. Like I said it was. Yeah, definitely. Well, it was funny. My, my wife and I, we, we we jokingly said we should go into the personal training forum and, and do some sort of landscape fit because yeah. it's a different kind different kettle of fish. You know, when I, I see guys who are going to the gym and you know they're all buff and stuff, I was like, oh, come on site with me for a day and see if you can handle it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Not, not to say I'm some sort of superhero, but it's just a different type of conditioning and it's it's hard on the body, especially yeah, when you do it for seven it's such a such a good uh, workout though because it's such it's an all round workout and it's like because uh, I did a personal training course and they were talking about the differences between using machine weights and free weights. So when you're using free weights, your arms can sort of move around a bit, and it, um, so you're using more muscles to hold them in place. And it's like that with landscaping, like when you're picking up uh, picking up a wheelbarrow, using so many different muscles to to move around. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. I've yeah, been um, yeah AFL footballers. An AFL footballer worked for us, and um, and he couldn't use a pair of bolt cutters because he just didn't have that strength. Like he had muscles on his muscles, but they weren't the right ones. Yeah, it's funny that. Yeah, I mean, it's like a shovel. You know, you especially a long handle shovel. You know, if you're you're using that all day, you know, because it's like a it's such a strange feeling. You, you've got a weight, a heavy weight, on the end of quite a long piece of timber. You know, <laughs> and it's difficult to to try and keep it balanced and keep your body in place but yeah it's just a yeah to all the kids out there it's just it's not glamorous it's not easy it's bloody hard work and you know you have to be really mentally tough i think more than anything Mm. so just being just the two of you do you have any machines that you utilize to make things easier for you funnily enough yeah we just um stumbled across the muck truck wheelbarrow and think it's the best thing ever so um you know a lot of gardens in Tassie, a lot of yards in Tassie are all on slopes of varying degrees. So, you know, pushing barrows up slopes is just its not fun for anybody, especially when you're doing it all day and, you you know, you're having to push up barrows, barrows of blue metal or something. It's just, it's harsh. I mean, we use, you know, like a Toro um, track loader or Toro track uh, dingo type thing. Yep. Uh, we use those a lot. But yeah, muck truck wheelbarrows. We've just started using one of those, and yeah, it's game changer, definitely. Is that a petrol powered wheelbarrow? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And normal size wheelbarrow, is it? No, it's um, funnily enough, we worked it out. I think the muck truck that we were using was taking about two normal barrows in this bucket. Yeah, right. So, um, you know. It's it's more or less effortless. They're, they're easy to steer. I think they can go up flights of stairs and things like that. So they're just yeah, super super useful. Definitely. Uh, and I saw that you do design as well. So does that both of you do design? No, it's just me. Yep. Yeah, it's just me. So all the design work is 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 basically done by me. So I I do all my designs by hand. So I sketch them all out and and draft them all. Yeah. Is that uh, that graphics design coming through again? Yeah. Well, the, the thing was in in high school. Funnily enough, the the two subjects that I did really well in, which was was only two because everything else was pretty media, <laughs> was technical drawing and environmental science. So those two, little did I know in year eleven and twelve that um, those two subjects combined would be what I was doing for the rest of my life. So yeah, it's crazy how things work out like that. Yeah, it's weird. Sort of writing was on the wall there, but um, yeah, you can see it. Yeah, it's like like there's things where you, you learn at school and thinking, I'm never going to use this in my life. This is just a waste of time. 
And there's some things you were right about that. You never use them in your life and that was a waste of time. But then there's other things that, that uh, yeah, that helped out. Whether you retain that information that you learned when you were 15 and 16 is another thing, but at least you've had a, had a taste of it. Yeah. yeah, I think there's there's a lot to be said about uh, the curriculum and uh, what's useful and what's not. I think for us, you know, it's perimeter area. <laughs> Things like that are pretty important. Basic addition, you know, mm. I don't think it gets much more complicated than that in our sort of line of work. Yeah, yeah. I had a guy, an apprentice. I put him on, and uh, he I gave him a plan to work off, and I can't remember what he was working out, but he's working out. He was having to read the plans, so I told him how to use like to measure. Yeah, you know, a centimeter is a meter, and um, and he said he came, he came after me after about twenty minutes saying I just can't work out how to do it. Like it's just too much for him. So yeah, some things you take, take for granted. Oh geez. So are you designing any Japanese gardens or getting to do any of them in Tasmania? No. I, I designed one a, probably a couple of years ago, but uh, it never ended up coming to fruition. Um I've done a few smaller ones, nothing really major. But the the thing is, although that's what I'm sort of best at if it's that if that's all i did then <laughs> i don't think we'd be in business for very long yeah uh you know when you first start business and you know you, you talk to to people in business you know they used to say oh get a niche like you know because that's where you can make a lot of money or that's where you can make yourself a name or whatever and it's like well that's all well and good but i think japanese gardens sort of had their day and, and that's sort of in the past now and you know the sort of inquiries that, that come through are pretty varied so if that's all i did i'd be out of work for probably most of the year yeah so um yeah we, we're doing a lot of a lot of really different stuff at the moment have you been over to japan yeah I have my wife and i went for our honeymoon in uh, 2012 oh, cool. so we uh we went in winter when it was the cheapest so it was like minus one everywhere and Tokyo was just crazy. We went and saw um, Emperor's Palace there and got lost because it's massive. <laughs> so um, didn't really see much of Japan. I'd like to go back, to be honest, and, and yep. do it properly when it's not winter. Yeah, go in spring and see the uh, flowering cherries. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of really good installations, like really big, big gardens and things like that over there that I'd like to see, both modern and, and more traditional. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, I met you at the Flower and Garden Show this year. So is that something you've been to before? Or is this the first time you went down there? Uh, my wife and I have been a few times. We uh, started, I think the first one I went to was, oh, God, I couldn't even remember now. I think it was 20, 2017, 2018 or something. And, yeah, my wife and I just decided to go every year. And, and that's what we do, just to, to to meet people and to sort of see what's uh what's going on in, in different places and, you know, uh, mean people like you. <laughs> so it was good. Yeah. It's a good experience. And, I'm, you know, I think I think more people from interstate should go just to basically chew the fat with people and do a bit of soft networking and, you know, see what uh, other people are doing and what new products are coming out. It's a really good, really good thing. Yeah, I was blown away. There's actually a lot of people from interstate that go there, like from um... – Oh, South Australia, I reckon, would be the most represented state outside of Victoria. I would guess that. Yeah, I don't know, because it's probably the closest to, similar to Sydney, and New South Wales as well. But, yeah, it's, it's pretty pretty interesting seeing how many different people go from interstate. Um, so have you have the, you seen things there and you think, I'm going to work that into designs coming up? Not necessarily. I mean, it's just good to see basically other, other design styles. Like, I like seeing different styles. Because you know, sometimes, especially down here, there's a lot of a lot of like more native style gardens down here. So a lot of natural style, sort of using rock and gravel and lots of native species and things like that. But seeing some like uh, mint designs winning garden was just crazy. Like just seeing some really different out there ideas it was just mad. Yeah, it's it's really good. It sort of inspires you in a way and. Some of the things I think, oh, yeah, I'd definitely like to to try and work that into a garden. But mostly I don't go there for ideas. I just go there to see 
what uh, what's going on and who's who in the zoo type of thing. Yep. Um, so have you got plans to to put on employees in the future, or are you just, have you given up? Yeah, I haven't given up. I mean, you know, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm not an old I'm not an old fella, but I'm not a spring chicken, so I'm sort of getting to the stage where, you know, I'm thinking body's all right at the moment, but you know, I've had a I've had a back issue since I was you know in my early twenties. I've got a fused vertebrae in my spine. Yeah. So when I had that checked out, the doctors, when I was like 20 years old, the doctor said to me, I think you need to find a new line of work. And I said, well, it's all well and good, but, you know, <laughs> I'm 21, 22, and I've got, a, I've got a newborn and I've got to provide. I can't really just go and do that. So it's just something uh, I had to stick with. And over the years, you know, like you said, you, it's just a conditioning thing and you get get used to it certain muscles get stronger and it's not an issue at the moment but sometimes if i push myself too hard i regret it so answer to your question yeah i probably would like to put somebody on but in a more sort of labor role just just to start with because you know it takes a lot to have to put your faith in somebody especially when you go to that next level of you know, being able to be autonomous on the job and actually can read a plan, like you said, and <laughs> can can read elevations and things like that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's one of those things when you're doing it, been doing it for such a long time, you take it for granted what all the skills that you've built up over, you know, the eleven years you've been in business. Crazy, yeah, definitely. Now, what's up? One of the questions I saw because you did a good Instagram post where you were sort of introducing yourself and you talked about your. Uh, design style is classified as versatile if you had to describe in one word yeah because i think that some people or some designers can get shoehorned into a style or 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 into a certain way of doing things like you know i suppose they play to their strengths and and say that you know this is what i'm good at so i'm going to design gardens like this you know modern gardens or whatever it happens to be but i think from my point of view to be somebody who I would consider a good designer, you know, should be able to take on any style of garden and be able to execute it, you know, just as well. So, you know, like I said, I don't get a lot of Japanese gardens coming over the desk. So I have to be versatile in a way and be able to adapt, you know, so I can pull off a native garden or or I can pull off a modern garden or, you know, something in between or doing something more traditional. So I think that yeah, versatile is probably the, the the way I'd describe my style because I think that every designer should to try and take on something different instead of doing the same old thing. Push yourself out of your comfort zone and try and take on something that you haven't done for with plants you've never used and and, and really put your put your brand on it, put your style on it and yeah, and it keeps it interesting trying to grow and change change where you do things. But I think a lot of designers can get sort of pigeonholed because they do such an awesome job of a certain style that that's what people want. So people go to them wanting the same thing that they've done before. So then it looks like they're doing the same thing over and over again, but that they're just doing what the client wants. Yeah, I couldn't think of anything worse. I mean, it must be great, you know, getting people ringing you up to do what you're good at, you know, or a certain style, or if you, you know, you're good at Aussie native coastal style or something to do those sorts of jobs all the time would be fantastic. But um, I think, you know, for me personally, I, I really like the the variation in, in the sort of stuff that comes my way. So, but funnily enough, that might be, you know, I might be doing different, different styles, but it all sort of has a very Japanese sort of, undertone to it of being simple and practical and pragmatic so it's just one of those things that um i think it comes with experience when you you have a set of values or you have a set of parameters that you use on your designs that it sort of reflects in in different styles if you take them on yeah we've got a um at, at the moment we're working on a design that's pretty coastal and also one that's got a bit of a japanese twist in it as well so yeah, it just keeps it keeps it interesting. Definitely, it can be hard as well to to take on 
like especially themed gardens. Like I remember back in the day, like people always wanted themed gardens, you know, like tropical gardens, or they wanted a, a Japanese garden or like a Thai style garden with Buddhas everywhere. And I'm not sure if that was a sign of the times or whether or not people still want that sort of thing. But um, yeah, it, it can be difficult to try and, uh, especially when you're not too familiar with, you know, that particular, the nuances in a style. And then you, you try and apply what you think is the right thing. And somebody who really knows what they're doing might look at it and go, how unbelievably kitschy is this? Yeah. Where there are nuances that you might not be aware of, especially with Japanese style gardens, it's really difficult because I see a lot of people trying it and I just pull it apart and look at it <laughs> and, and think, well, you know, there are some really kitschy stuff, some, you know, like the red torii gates or something like that in the garden, like they're just making me vomit, <laughs> you know. But that's just because I have, you know, a, a different perspective on it, really, and experience. But yeah, there's definitely nuances with different thematic sort of style gardens. It can be really difficult to to do it successfully. Yep. Yeah. And just before we started recording, we were talking about the Japanese gardens' use of rocks and how they always have their rocks in triangles and groups of groups of threes. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. yeah. Whereas some people might just put rocks in because they think they f- they fit into a garden, but yeah, there's extra levels of detail that they go to. Yeah, for sure. You know, especially with like distances away from from like the viewing points as well. So like larger, heavier rocks, you know, when I say heavy, I don't mean literally, but like with more mass or size, you know, they go to the back, you know, and the, the smaller, smaller rocks are in the foreground, you know, as opposed to putting a dirty, great big rock, you know, right next to a path or really close to, you know, maybe a window from inside, you know, they're, they're looking outside into the garden and there's a, a dirty, great big rock is right there, you know, so that's another thing that I try and work on is the sort of view from the garden or the view of the garden from the inside of the house through the windows. I think that's really important. Yeah, that's where you're looking at it most of the time. Yeah, definitely. Especially now in the winter. Mm, especially in Tasmania. Yeah, it was pretty cold the other morning. I'm not liking it at all. It's a little bit different to WA, the weather. <laughs> yeah, when I when I moved over here from WA... It was the rudest awakening <laughs> of everything because I'm not sure if, you, if you've been to Perth or not, but it's just, it still gets cold over there because it's always so, you know, the weather's mostly, it's quite fair and fine most of the time. So the, the nights can get cold and get some really cold mornings. But, you know, it's like, it's very predictable in Perth. So, you know, it's usually bloody hot through the day and then about three o'clock rolls around and the Fremantle Doctor wind system comes in and cools things down. It's pretty reliable. But over here, it's like there's so many different little microclimates. You know, there's little valleys everywhere and, there's you know, it's very hilly and mountainous, so you get totally different weather systems. You know, like where I live down here in northern Antarctica, it's sort of like, you know, you can be, it can be bucketing down with rain here but then across the river, it can be dry as a board and it's not rained all day. And you you, you got to think, well, do I go to work today? It's, it's absolutely bucketing down here, but over there it's it's dry as a board. So apart from the 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 cold as well, which you know being from the UK wasn't really such a wasn't such a, a big deal for me. But um just the the geology and the ground conditions. Is really the the rudest awakening, <laughs> especially uh, the this this mysterious substance called clay that I don't think uh, exists in Perth. <laughs> yeah, they, they they bring it in. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's uh, one of those things. Like it's a complete sand and limestone type of environment over there. Mm. And um, I remember I went back to Perth to see my wife's family well years ago. And the road workers were doing some civil civil contracting and there was just these mountains mountains of sand that they dug out and i just i felt like weeping i felt like saying you know sand what is that <laughs> <laughs> this awesome stuff that you can dig through easily yeah over here it's like 
you know, you need a, a, a huge bar and a mattock and and then you, you knack it after five minutes and, and then you, you know, you're calling for the 1.8 ton digger to come in and give you a hand. Mm-hmm. What's, so the, was, what's the landscaping uh, industry like in Tasmania, like in terms of other like other landscapers working together and being a good community? Does that, does that exist? Uh, well, I'm not sure necessarily from my point of view. I haven't really, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty isolated where I am. Um, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of really good contractors around. Um, there's a lot of good guys doing some good work, and there's a lot of stone work going on down here. There's some really good sort of stone mason landscapers, and I, you know, I respect their work a lot. But as a community, I mean, there's no um, there's no association, uh, a landscaping association down here. So I wouldn't really know if there's a a good community or not the only thing i can can say being down here for the last decade is that there's a lot of businesses that were operating when i started that aren't start that aren't there anymore yeah. <laughs> there's only like a select few that have, have really kept on and they're the ones that you know are sort of in a position where you know they're doing really well so it's good to see so how do you what have you learned about business like how do you learn what you know now is it all just by yeah, experiencing it and making it up as you go. Yeah, it's a lot of that. There's a lot of experience. I mean, you know, and you'd know as well. And you know, listening to the podcast is great because it it sort of shines a light on the fact that it's not just me that's going through these problems. You know, so it's just it's fully just an experience thing, and it's it's harsh, and it's really difficult a lot of the time, and especially when like my wife and I work together, so. Work is pretty much ninety percent of what we talk about, you know, all the time. Mm. But it's good because I've got somebody else to bounce things off, who knows what I'm talking about. Whereas if she worked and did her own thing, or you know, had a different career, she probably wouldn't understand the things that we go through. So it's just yeah, it's just experience. It's like I said, just putting yourself out there and doing it, you know the best you can but not giving up I suppose because over the years I've had a few ups and downs and I've had moments where I've just thought like packing it in and going and working at Bunnings or something you know but I haven't and you know I'm still here (laughs) and I still continue to 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 try and improve all the time so yes I mean for, for young guys out there or young people they want to get into it. It's just a thing of, um, I think it's a famous saying of if there's an option to take the elevator or to take the stairs, to, to take the stairs because um, the elevator is not the way to go. Mm. And, um, you know, from not just working in Tassie and, and doing this sort of job, but when, when I worked in Perth for different people, like the experience was invaluable because i saw how not to run a business it wasn't the best environment for me to learn and to to grow as a tradesman and all that sort of thing but it it showed me how to not run a business i think that was that was one of the most valuable things was to to not get in that position where you owe you know half a million dollars to unsecured creditors and you've got people ringing you up and uh, and threatening you so that <laughs> That was what was going on with this uh, this other employee I used to work four years ago. Um, very very bad situation. But it's learning. It's learning from other people's mistakes as as well. If you can do that, that's really important. Absolutely. Yeah, because it's um it's one thing to be taught how to do business, but you can learn just as much as for by seeing how not to. Um, exactly. So. Yeah, hundred percent. So what what keeps you motivated? Because it sounded like like yeah, like when you were thinking of you know going to work at Bunnings, what's what makes you want to keep keep going doing landscaping? Is it because you because you love doing it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, as much as I tell myself sometimes that I hate doing what I do or I have in the past, I really don't. Especially like coming to the garden show as well, sort of it reinvigorates you, sort of thing. And I think there's just so many things that I've still got to do. I still feel as though I've got to do in my career. You know, I'd really love to do a 
a flower and garden show one year and I know it, it would be super difficult coming from Tassie and doing it but it's something that I think I need to do so there, there's still a few things on the list that I haven't done yet so I think that's what keeps me motivated and you know I think the best part of the job is when you, you revisit a garden after three or four years and you still have a really good relationship with the client. You can ring them up and, you know, within a week you can organise to go around and have a cup of tea and walk around the garden and talk about, you know, how they use the space. And I had a, a very big project that we did that we've um, photographed a lot of and it's on the Instagram account quite a lot. And that was done like three years ago and we've got a really, really good relationship with them. We can go around there and, and chew the fat and, and talk about the garden. And like when they first approached me, they said, you know, this is quite funny, actually. You'll probably get a kick out of it. The the brief for the design was they wanted Paul Bangay, but with low maintenance. And um, I said, you do realise that there's like an army of people that look after those gardens and, and keep them looking the way they do. And uh, so the, the thing was, you know, that the brief was low maintenance and I gave that to them. But then when I saw them, they said that they're in the garden all the time. So it's sort of like it made me feel good that I've invigorated them to get in their garden and, and they had a lot of pride and they looked after it fantastic. And that's what makes all the difference, you know, mm -hmm. when, you go back to a job and they've really looked after it yeah that's pretty cool get to because that's something i think needs to be uh reminded to some people every now and then is that you're not just doing another job it's actually uh, it means a lot more to the to the client so yeah definitely. Yeah, don't just treat it like a normal job yeah and last question for you, adam is who do you think would be a good guest to have on the podcast well this is a difficult one uh, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of designers that I admire. There's a lot of landscapers out there that that would be worthy as guests. But I think for me, I probably have to go back to my formative years in Perth, and one designer that was very very influential and still is today. She's still working. Would be Janine Mendel from Cultivar Landscaping or Cultivar Design. I'm not sure. I can't quite right. remember. Janine Mendel. I'd say she'd yeah. be a good guest. She's been in the game for a long time. Yeah, cool. So did you work with her or you just saw her work? I, 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 I worked for uh, a guy that used to do a lot of her work, but she she's pretty prolific around around the Perth scene and she's sort of a bit of a uh, a big wig, I think. Oh, cool. All right. I'll, I've been meaning to send out messages for the last two days to get people on, so I'll add her to my list and send that out tomorrow. Yeah. But. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate your time and sharing your stories. Yeah, it's fascinating hearing you know, work in, what it's like to work in WA and then Tasmania, a couple of two extremes. So thank you very much for sharing it. No worries. Thanks a lot for inviting me on and uh, appreciate it.